podcast hello everyone and welcome to tonight's live stream uh glad that we got you guys here we already have five or six people over on instagram and uh we just got on less than a minute ago over on the other platforms but tonight we are live on facebook our actual new facebook page uh, fortress canine kennels we are on YouTube at Fortress K9. We are on Twitch. We are on Twitter. We are on Float. And on my phone, we are on Instagram. And uh, if you guys don't follow us on TikTok, but you are on TikTok, um, I would appreciate it if you went over there and followed us. Once we hit 1,000 um, followers over there, I think it's 1,000 is my understanding, uh, we should be able to start streaming live. And I'll put another phone on this side of the uh, computer and uh and we will be able to start streaming live to TikTok as well all right so with that let's go ahead and jump into tonight's podcast recording hello everyone and welcome to episode 129 of the protection dog podcast where we offer an alternative to conventional training methods and philosophy i am your host joel riles and today we are going to talk about 10 ways to make yourself more free 10 ways to make yourself more free we will be touching on quite a few uh security and dog related topics as we go through that and uh so i hope you guys find it enjoyable today is december 22nd only three days till christmas Woo! i hope you guys are ready uh in the year 2022 so this year is almost over if you are trying to plan for the year 2023 Go on to my YouTube channel and check out last week's podcast on how to uh, do annual planning for your most successful year ever. Uh, that wasn't the title of it, but that's basically what we're talking about. Um, so tonight we are going to be talking about 10 ways to make yourself more free. Tonight I am drinking Johnny Walker Black Label. By the way, in case you guys think that that's all I drink. Um, it's my first drink almost every night because after that you can't quite appreciate how good it is. So I go to my slightly lesser things after that. And I'm not smoking this quite yet because I wanted to save it until after, but I found one of my Cohiba red dots in the center console of my truck. And I was super excited about it. Now Cohiba is one of my favorite brands of cigars. My actual favorites of Cohiba's are the black dot number one and the blue dot number two but the red dot is definitely still a really good cigar and so i'll be saving that for later and uh smoking that this evening when i do our motivational video uh probably about 20 or 30 minutes after this is finished being recorded all right so before we jump into today's topic let's talk about today's sponsor today's sponsor is fortress canine Fortress K9 is, uh, offers personal family and executive protection dogs. So what really sets us apart is two major things. Number one, we put a lot of effort and energy into making sure our dogs are what we call stable. What that means is they only bite when you either tell them to bite or you are physically attacked. And other than that, they do not bite. And uh, so they are safe around your, your kids, your family, uh, your friends, taking them out in public, moving around with um, your like livestock or other animals and all that kind of stuff. And the other thing that we do, which a lot of people in the dog world um, don't like and they don't agree with, and that's fine. It, you as a, a dog owner or somebody who wants to get your dog trained have to decide who you connect with when you make these decisions. But our dogs are taught to fight a human being. And part of that is to reverse, we call it reverse, from one arm to the other to switch from one arm to the other if you are hitting them or presenting a threat with a weapon or something like that. So that is what uh, those two things are the two primary things that separate Fortress Canine Dogs uh, and the training that we do from most of the other people out there. So if you would like more information, 
and uh, and would like to connect with us, you can check out our website. It is FortressK9.com. That is F-O-R-T-R-E-S-S, the letter K, the number nine, dot com. You can also email me, Joel, J-O-E-L, at FortressK9.com. You can text me. Listen, I do not pick up phone uh, calls that I don't recognize. I am too busy during the day uh, trying to manage and maintain everything that we have going on here. So if you give me a phone call and leave a message, I will try to check it out. But that may happen quickly or it may happen in six weeks from now. So if you want to reach me via my phone number, text me and let me know what you're interested in, um, you know, what information you need. And we will text back and forth a little bit. And then when it's time for us to get on a phone call, we will schedule that via text. And my number is 813-836-9244. You can also connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, MeWe, Float, TikTok, and I think that's most of them. Uh, oh, and now on Twitter. Um, but if you're going to send me a DM uh, because you want to find out more information about our dogs, uh, Instagram is the most likely place that I will see that quickly. Uh, so I would encourage you to uh, contact us through that. Don't forget, if you're listening to this podcast as a podcast and not watching it as a live stream, um, Check out the Fountain app at fountain.fm. Uh, I don't have an affiliation with them, but if you listen to our podcast there, um, you will get little teeny bits of Bitcoin as you listen. And um, and as you're going to hear us talk about today a little bit more about Bitcoin, uh, maybe you will be a little bit more interested in it as you go along. So um, with that, let's go ahead and jump into today's notes and updates. So our training story for today, um, we were tracking today, Thursday uh, mornings is our tracking day, and I was, I, I've been running tracks because we've been making them a little bit harder um, for each other, so I've been the last couple weeks where when he starts tracking, I'm already out of sight of his starting point, so I haven't been watching his initial starts to his tracks, and uh, and today what I did was I ran essentially the perimeter of our big open field that we have in the back so i kind of got about three quarters of the way or maybe a little bit more around and i had a little spot i could kind of stand behind some brush and so i was able to watch him cast off today and one of the things that i realized was he his dog is so high energy that when he first casts off he has a hard time distinguishing is he just trying to run and, and pull and go places or is he actually tracking, right? And so we talked about how to start your tracks under control. But what I wanted to mention a little bit more here is um, he was in the middle of his track and his dog had kind of settled into the track. And then he just began to kind of question, well, is he actually tracking or is he not tracking? I'm not really sure, right? And if you want to call it a mistake, the thing that he did uh, now he got back on track and all of that kind of stuff, but he ended up pulling his dog off and kind of going back a little bit and restarting, uh, not all the way to the beginning, but he just kind of went back a little bit and recast and then he continued tracking, was he started to question whether his dog was doing what he was asking him to do, which was to track. And he questioned it for maybe like uh, 50 yards, right? Or 25 yards, somewhere in there, was not very far. And I'm like, when you're walking at the pace that a dog is pulling you and you're tracking, that's like 15 seconds. And I said, if you're questioning whether your dog is on track, go like mentally mark that spot, but go with them for like a minute, maybe even two. It depends on the environment you're in. Um, if it's difficult to keep track of where that last spot was, you may not go that far. But don't immediately assume your dog is not doing what you're asking them to do. In fact, Part of trust your dog in a track is assume they are doing what you want them to do. Keep an eye on them. If it's questionable, you know, you're, you're kind of trying to evaluate it, but don't make your natural assumption that the dog is not doing what you want or that the dog is not going to do what you want. And this applies more generally across the board too. make the assumption that your dog is going to do what you say. And then if they don't, you deal with that. If it's an obedience thing, you may correct. If it's a tracking thing, you, you may go back and recast different things like that, right? But I see this all the time uh, in my clients is 
um, you know, they'll, their dog will be up on a table and it, it'll be sitting up and they'll tell it to lay down. And instead of just going plutz, they'll pop the dog while they say plutz at the same time. And um, because they're assuming the dog's not going to do what it's supposed to do. Right. So they correct where the lead direction is strong enough that it's a light correction as the command rather than saying to do the command and then pausing and seeing if the dog will do it. Right. They do it sometimes when their dogs, they want their dogs to jump up on the tables. They'll kind of snatch them up on the tables right off the bat instead of saying hup and giving the dog the opportunity to do it on their own. And then if they don't, then they give an assist. Um, and I see it a lot when we start doing stability training with the dogs is the handler will be holding the lead and I'll be agitating the dog and I'll move quickly and they'll pop their dog just because I moved. Right. Because they assumed when I moved, the dog was going to bite. And it's like, no, watch your dog, see what they do. And if they let you down, then you deal with it. Okay. And, and what they're doing at the time they let you down will dictate a lot of how you actually deal with that. But assume that they're going to do what you told them to do, or assume that they are doing what you told them to do. And then watch and see, and then deal with it if you find that they're not doing that. But you will observe and you will notice a lot of things about your dog if you do that. All right. So what is new on the dog stead? Well, the two primary things that are new on the dog stead is we have Malinois puppies on ground. Super exciting. They're just over four weeks old. In fact, they'll be four weeks or they'll be five weeks old this Sunday. Uh, we got all of our selections in from the people who have uh, deposits on their puppies. I am behind. I need to go through those. Uh, and um, and send out, you get this puppy, you get that puppy. Um, we had five puppies in this litter. All puppies are reserved and sold. So if you are interested in getting one of our Malinois puppies, uh, contact me. I have a couple of breedings uh, planned this year. Excuse me, one is a Malinois Dust Shepherd Cross, and the other one is a straight Malinois breeding. Uh, both of those I'm very excited about. So reach out and contact me if you're interested. Our Dutch Shepherd puppies should be born any hour now. Now, I could say that and it could be two days, but she has dropped. She's full of milk and she is ready to go for those little puppies. And she kind of looks at me when I walk by like, I don't know what's going on, but I'd really like for this to be over now. And uh, and so poor mama, we're ready for her to have her puppies. She's in the big whelping area. And uh, and so watch the uh, social media for the videos of little Dutch Shepherd nuggets uh, crawling around here, um, maybe even as early as this evening. That would be awesome. So uh, we're very excited about that. Uh, just a reminder, if you want to meet us in person or see some of our demos, we are going to be at the Self-Reliance Festival in Camden, Tennessee in March. Um, I am almost certainly at this point going to be at Nicole Sauce's Spring Workshop in Tennessee. I don't know what the city is that's closest to her. Uh, but she lives out in the country quite a bit. That will be in April. Um, oh, our calendar's down. Uh, that will be in April. And then um, I don't know if we are going to be at the Fall Self-Reliance Festival. Um, I believe that's in October because it's two weeks separated from Prepper Camp. And we are scheduled to be at Prepper Camp. And that's one's in North Carolina. And so I'm questioning whether I want to drive to North Carolina and then turn around and come back. And then two weeks later, drive back up to Tennessee and then turn around and come back. So I have to figure that out. Uh, but we will definitely be at Prepper Camp. I think it is like September 25th, 26th, 27th, somewhere right in there. Uh, it's like the last weekend in September or the second to last weekend of September, right in there. But if you go to PrepperCamp.com, uh, you'll be able to see that. And if you go to SelfRelianceFestival.com, you'll be able to see the dates for that. And, uh, and so if you want to meet us and see our dogs in action and, uh, and actually get some demonstrations, those are the places to do it at. Uh, also, don't forget to get on our email list, FortressK9.com and K9Academy.us. Uh, last week, I told you that we updated FortressK9.com, which that's actually my next bullet point. It's awesome. It looks great. Make sure you check it out. Um, but the one thing that I just sent over is I realized uh, we use an email program called Drip. It's kind of like MailChimp, but it's a MailChimp is limited. And the way that they charge you, it was just outrageous how much we were being charged. So uh, we switched over to Drip. And, um, and I realized the little pop-up that allows you to um, sign up for our email list uh, wasn't up earlier this week. So 
Um, initially, if you're listening to this, like, you know, after the new year in 2023 sometime, uh, then you should just be able to jump right into can- or FortressK9.com for that. Um, otherwise, um, go ahead and hop on to K9Academy.us if you want to sign up for that. Uh, that one works and uh, and it's fully functional there. Fortress K9 will be updated very, very soon. And um, the one thing that you'll notice on K9Academy.us, which we are working on, it seems like website stuff has been taking up a lot of my um, bandwidth lately, is the site runs a bit slow. And so we made a few changes on the hosting side. Um, they updated or they optimized the database and, and added a G zip file, which I don't know what that does, but it's supposed to help speed things up. It did help a little bit, but I have uh, some homework to do on that to finish uh, trying to speed that site up. So I'll be working on that. But I do know that it's running a little slow and we are working to get that running a little faster for you guys. And um, and then remember, if you want to interact, if you have something that you want me to reply to or comment on, um, please make sure you put that in all caps. If you're on a normal computer, that's easy. If you're on a cell phone, what you do is you double tap the little caps button and it will put you in caps lock. I don't know why people don't know that. Uh, I thought everybody knew that now, but apparently not everybody does. So if you want to type in all caps, what you do is you go tap tap on your your little caps button that gives you capital letters and it will lock you into caps lock and then you can just type away. So please make sure you put that in all caps so it stands out to me. Otherwise, I'm going to assume you guys are just talking to each other and I may skip it. All right. Um, Real quick, we uh, I wanted I got a couple comments. I really like it when you guys send me comments. Most of them aren't necessarily relevant to a broader audience. So I just go ahead and um, and reply directly to that person and then move on. Uh, But we got a couple that I thought would be relevant and helpful for you guys. And one of these is um, the guy asked me, I'm assuming it was a guy. Uh, and I didn't write down who sent these. So I apologize uh, to the folks who sent these over to me uh, for not giving you guys credit for that. But uh, I was asked thoughts on dog adjustments to a new home slash living areas and on a family moving out and the dogs, quote, miss the moved out human. So this is a couple of, of there's two different things, right? So adjustments to a new home slash living area. I've heard people talk about their dogs having anxiety in these situations. My general thought process on that is that probably if there's a lot of anxiety, if you move, that is probably because you don't have a very strong bond with your dog. Um, and just having a dog in your house doesn't mean you have a strong bond with your dog. Uh, if you have, you'll know you have a strong bond with your dog because in the evening when you sit down to relax, your dog comes in like lays either at your feet or up on the couch right beside you or something like that. Right. If they are trying to spend as much time with you as they can, then you have a good bond with your dog. If you have a good bond with your dog, being with their handler is much more important than being in a house. Um, I had two protection dogs while I was in the military and we moved all the time. And our dogs never once showed any anxiety over moving locations because they were with us, they were with their people. And so they didn't really care where we lived. They had zero, that had zero effect on them. If you don't have a strong bond with your dog and you move to a new location and and you see them having anxiety over that, my recommendation would be start spending a lot more personal time with the dog. And like this doesn't take extra work, right? If you like to watch TV in the evening, just call the dog over. If you need to put a lead on them to keep them there, do that. And then just have them with you. They don't even have to be doing an obedience thing. Just have them within arm's reach of you kind of reach out and pet on them a few times while you're watching your shows and just keep them close. And as they bond to you, the anxiety of the new location will have much less of an impact as a general rule. Now I'm sure there's some you know, potential neurological and, and really bad genetic things that could keep that from uh, happening. But in a, as a general rule, that should really take care of that. Now on the second topic, which is thoughts on a family moving out and the dogs missing the moved out human. Um, I'm assuming you're not meaning like, hey, this dog lived here with this family. The family left and abandoned the dog completely. And uh, and now I'm here. Um, So that's its whole own thing. But if you're talking about my kids are going off to college and the dog was really close to, you know, my son or my daughter or whoever has moved out. Or um, one of my clients right now has a dog where the dog was really his father's dog. Now, his father was elderly, had moved in and was living with them. And then the father passed away and now the dog, you know, quote, misses his person. And and if he was strongly bonded to him, 
uh, that can be a very real thing. I don't know if they experience the same emotions we do, but they definitely will demonstrate a, you know, I'm sad that my person is not around. Right. So again, the same kind of general issue tends to take care of it. So dogs don't necessarily love people the way that human beings think about that. Dogs bond to people. So I can spend a year to two years or so training a dog. It starts to bond to us, but we have methods that we do use to try and minimize that uh, from becoming too strong so that when they go to their families, they bond to their new families. This can take um, two to three months sometimes, right? Sometimes it happens really fast, but it can take just two to three months. And uh, really how fast it happens depends on how much time you spend with the dog, right? So if your dog is going through this and experiencing this, what I would encourage is um, probably one of the parents who are not going to be moving out, right? Um, go ahead and start keeping that dog close, uh, doing things with that dog, having it close in the evenings when you're relaxing and allowing that dog to uh, bond to a new person so that it's not constantly looking for the other person. Because once they become bonded, uh, especially strongly, um, if that person goes away and they don't have someone else to bond to, they will continue to express the anxiety over where is my person? I don't know where they are, right? Another uh, question I got was on vehicle prep for canine transport. So there's a couple of things. If your dog has never really ridden in a car um, before or not very often, a lot of dogs will get motion sickness riding in a car. So what I do with our dogs is I put crates in the vehicle. I load the dogs into their crates and then we go drive around. Right. And so as we drive around, um, initially they will get some motion sickness. And then as they get used to driving around, it just goes away. So having a crate in the vehicle will solve a lot of the potential issues because if you're the only one in the vehicle and you're the one driving, you don't want to be trying to turn around and grab a lead or do something with the dog while you're supposed to be focusing on the road. Um, I do that all the time with my wife just to annoy her, but you don't want to be doing that as a general rule. Oh yeah, baby. And um, so as it, so, what I like to do is I like to put them in crates. The uh, What you will sometimes get, especially if they haven't been crate trained, although occasionally, even if they are, and then you put them in a crate and start driving a vehicle around, is they'll start to whine and or bark. Now, usually the whine or bark means I don't feel good and I want out of this, right? The motion sickness thing. Um, so I'll verbally correct, but I just drive them around until they get used to it. And then once they're good in a crate, then I can start letting them loose into the vehicle. If I want them in the back seat and they keep trying to climb into the front seat, I will use a lead, which is why I designed and use the leads the way that we do. I will use a lead and I will tether them to a seat or tether them to something in the, the part of the vehicle that I want them to stay in so that they can't come up. And I'm not trying to push a dog out of my lap whilst driving down the road in traffic. Right. And uh, so if, uh, you hear this and you were the one that asked that question and I didn't answer some specific um, thought that you had, uh, please um, send me another message and I will address that. And then um, I've been posting a few things about the Dark Systems helmet and the canine helm. There are two different companies that make a canine helmet system. And, um, and somebody commented about the customer service and about how it was terrible and it was hard to reach them and blah, blah, blah. So, this is not in defense of that per se. This is just my experience and with dealing with both companies and my experience running my own business. When you're running a small business, you it's not like you have a big corporation and there's six people that uh, answer phone calls and there's people that there's a whole customer service department and there's a whole shipping department and there's a whole operations department. When you're running a small business, one person may have all of those tasks or one person may have at least several of those tasks. And usually if you have three or four people, you've grown enough that all three or four of those people are busy out of their minds all the time, right? While they're working that business. So um, on the canine helm side specifically, uh, I have had very, very good luck uh, Instagram messaging him. He's been very responsive to that. Uh, and when I want a new helmet, I don't go look at the website. I send him a message and say, is this helmet available? He'll say yes or no, like, no, it's still in development or whatever. And if he says yes, I go, I want one. How much does it cost? He says it costs this much. I say, send me an invoice. Here's my email again. He sends me the invoice. I pay. And then, you know, he usually gives me a time frame. And 
the just expectations, it's several months, right? Sometimes three or four or six months, depending on uh, what his current backlog is. Because remember, these companies don't make their money selling their helmets one and two at a time to us, right? There's not enough of a demand for that. They make their money selling 10 at a time to a police department or a sheriff's office, uh, 100 at a time to a military unit, things like that, right? That's where they make their money is doing larger bulk sales to military and law enforcement. And so our orders just kind of get tossed onto that and, uh, and sent out. Okay. So if you're interested in one of these systems, just keep that in mind. Now, specifically, this person said uh, they had ordered a dark systems helmet when they were talking about getting the helmet. They got great customer service. And then they sent in, I don't know if they paid in full or sent in a deposit. And then they, they're having a harder time getting a hold of them. Okay. Again, I'm not justifying it. I'm just telling you the reality of the situation. The reality in a small business is when you're trying to get a new sale, that new sale can be absolutely critical to that business making it to the next week or the next month. And so you're going to give a lot more focus on that next sale. And then once you have the sale, you're not trying to ignore your customers, but you've got to make the next sale and the next sale and the next sale, especially early on and when your business is just getting started. Uh, which can be very stressful for a business, right? So my recommendation, and I had a similar situation with dark systems, but because I knew the timeframes and kind of how long it took to get my helmets through K9 Helm, uh, I didn't have this expectation that I was going to have, you know, a shipment in the next couple of days, right? I knew this is probably going to be a couple months out. So I would just once a week, I would send them another message, right? Because keep in mind how the messaging systems work. If you send a message and then a bunch of other people send the message, your message gets pushed down and it's probably still has a little blue dot, but it's down near the bottom. Well, typically when you open that up and start responding, you start at the top and you start working your way down. Well, if you only make it halfway down and your comment was below that, then the next day there's going to be more and they only get halfway and your comment just keeps getting pushed down. So if about once a week you send them another message, the chances that one of those weeks you're going to be in that top 50% that actually gets responded to that day is much higher. So just keep that kind of stuff in mind. Um, it can be a real challenge to run a small business. The first several years of our business was very, very challenging. Uh, it's much more smooth now, but there are still times, especially if we have multiple litters on ground, trying to keep track of who's getting what puppy and did we reach out and connect and, and did we send the messages we were supposed to and we just sold a new dog, but they were asking for pictures or videos of their dog and did we get it? I mean, there are times when it can get very overwhelming and then there are times when it's much more calm, right? And so uh, I would just encourage you to have a little bit of patience with these guys. Um, I didn't get stiffed or screwed over by either of them. There are things I like and dislike about both systems, but, um, but they both um, sent me my stuff and it does take a little while. So just kind of have a realistic expectation there. All right, probably spent too much time on that because most of you probably aren't interested in helmets. So let's go ahead and jump into the actual topic for today, 10 ways to make yourself more free. So if we're gonna talk about making yourself more free, then the first thing we have to do is define freedom. Now, we could probably spend six hour and a half long episodes talking about freedom and just scratch the surface of on a deeper level what this really means. So for the sake of this discussion, we're going to simplify the definition of freedom down to this. It is a lack of tyranny in your life. And we're going to define that in just a second. What is tyranny? And it is being able to make choices free of coercion. Okay, so co coercion is someone forcing you or really strongly um, pestering or pushing you to make a specific decision, but not necessarily restriction. So the voluntarist would say something like, we have a non-aggression principle which says, you're not allowed to be aggressive toward anyone else unless you're defending your property, meaning they were already aggressive toward you. So you can use force to stop their aggression, but you can't go out and initiate aggression. Okay. So the restriction is you can't go take anybody else's property. You can't go out and start being um, aggressive toward another person. But outside that, outside of harming another person's property or body, you should be able to pretty much do what you want. 
Okay. And, um, and again, I, we could spend hours and hours going into all times of little nuance, but for the sake of our discussion today, that's generally what we're talking about. So what is tyranny? Tyranny, and this is where we get into to almost what's more important than freedom, is any real, so our actual government would be the real, or perceived authority. Now, when I say a real authority, I'm not necessarily saying this is a uh, just authority. I'm just saying it's a real authority, right? If you break a law and the government becomes aware of it, there's a very high probability a person with a gun will show up and put shiny bracelets on you. Okay. So any real or perceived authority requiring you to do something such as register a vehicle or restricting you from doing something such as buying a gun if you want to, or having a, some chickens on your property in a city, right? Something like that. So long as the thing you're trying to do doesn't harm another person, that is tyranny. So there's tyranny and freedom are both on this spectrum, right? There's like absolute tyranny, which means you can't do anything without permission and you have to do everything they tell you, which we've never fully gotten to, right? We've had bad tyrannies, uh, the USSR, China, um, you know, places like that have been bad tyrannies, but they've never gotten to the point where every decision, every person living there had to make, they had to ask permission for, and they had to do every single thing that was told of them. Right. And we've never had a complete full freedom. And I don't think we ever will. I think these are just ends of a spectrum and we should push much more toward getting as close to freedom as we can without moving in the direction of tyranny. Okay. So this is not a oh, you should go complete anarchy or, you know, or complete tyranny. And I don't think we would ever reach either one of those spectrums. I think it's if there, there are ways to judge which direction are we moving? Are we moving toward more freedom or are we moving toward more tyranny? All right. So keep that in mind as we go. So all of the things, the next 10 things we're going to talk about are how to move in the direction of freedom. Okay. This is not, by the way, a political thing. This is not go vote and and force everybody to move in the direction of freedom. If somebody wants more tyranny in their life, go get more tyranny in your life. But just don't try to bring that tyranny into my life. So these things we're going to talk about are primarily individual or at the family level. They're not at like group societal level types of things. These are things that you can do Personally, you could start doing them this evening if you wanted to, and you would move in the direction of more freedom. So number one is take control of your mind. So, and this is, this is foundational to everything else we're going to talk about. And it's also one of the hardest parts to get through and to get over. Okay. So this is the one you almost have to do before you can really do any of the rest of these. I mean, you can take steps in some of the rest of these and still be in the process of this first one. We talked about the perceived authority, right? When I talk about perceived authority being part of tyranny, most of what that is, is peer pressure, right? You should put up a Ukraine flag on your, your little icon on your social media so that people know you stand with Ukraine. Well, first of all, nobody that has that on their, their icon is standing with Ukraine because putting that on your icon does absolutely zero to help Ukraine, right? So you're not really standing with Ukraine. You're just, um, what do they call it? Um, virtue signaling. You're giving a virtue signal that, Ooh, I want look at me. I'm so moral, right? When you didn't have to do anything to actually be moral. So, um, that perceived authority part is largely that it's also things like the news media telling you, you should do this. You really should do it. We're the experts. Do what we say. And you go, oh, well, I guess they're the experts, right? Like things like believe science, right? Oh, you don't believe the science. There is no such thing as science to believe. Science is a process that finds errors. That's what science is. So as you're going through and trying to find out what's true and what's not true about a particular thing, the scientific method is a process that allows you to figure out, here's my guess about how this thing works. It's called a hypothesis. And then you go, I'm going to do this experiment to see if the thing I guess is right is actually right. And then you have to actually make a 
process that will determine that, which a lot of errors are often found there. And then you do that process and you go, oh, what I thought was correct is not correct. So then you modify your hypothesis, you change it a little and you try it again. And that is what science is. Science is never settled ever, ever. Science doesn't settle anything. Science is always in flux. Science is always learning new things. Um, you know, they thought that they understood how medicine worked in the 1900s. And now we know, you know, almost infinitely more than them. And in another 100 years, we're going to know almost infinitely more than we know now. Right. So there's no such thing as science being settled. But when the, the news media and the people you're listening to keep telling you, listen to the science, don't be a science denier, don't be a climate change denier, don't be a this, don't be a that. That is them creating a perceived authority for you to try and force you into believing a certain thing. We're going to get into more of your perceptions and thoughts that, you know, later on down here, but take control of your own mind. Okay. So some things that you can do that start to really help with that. Start reading. Now I don't have time to sit down with a book in front of me very often, but I like to get audio books and listen to them while I'm doing other tasks. Listen to podcasts, listen to opposing views from people who encourage freedom or I'm sorry, and from people who encourage freedom. So you should listen to the arguments that if, if you're striving for freedom and you believe freedom is the direction we should go, listen to what socialists say. And don't just sit there and in your mind go, oh, that's not a bit of a, no, actually go, hmm, what do they have right here? And what do they have wrong here? Because there's nothing, there's no perspective that has everything wrong. Right. If it had everything wrong, nobody would have that perspective. So there's obviously things in each perspective that are right. And there are things in each perspective that are problematic. And when we listen to these opposing views, we step out of the echo chamber. An echo chamber is where you surround yourself by people who all agree with you. And it just makes you feel like you're more and more and more right because nobody challenges your ideas. So because almost all of the social media platforms, if you go onto the, the truth socials and the MeWe and the hyper freedom so, um, social platforms that have been created in opposition to big tech, almost everybody over there is on the, the more conservative side, right? So you get an echo chamber of conservatism. And then you go over to the Facebooks and the Instagrams and the Twitters, you know, Twitter's apparently trying to change some of that, but still largely you get the left wing echo chamber going on right and you get very little of the opposing viewpoints and in both situations that creates problems okay so listen to things that challenge your views and i really appreciate some of the podcasts that i listen to will actually bring people on that the hosts generally i align with but the person that they're interviewing i don't necessarily and i'm tempted and this is the hard part about it. I'm, I'm tempted. Sometimes I just get frustrated. Like, why aren't you saying this? Or why aren't you responding that way or whatever? And I get tempted to just turn it off and move to something else. And I go, no, I need to listen to this person's perspective and stop creating an argument in my mind against everything they're saying and just say, that's very interesting. Hmm. I'll have to think about that a little bit. Okay. What's their next idea? Oh, wow. Okay. Well, I, I disagree with it, but let me, let me give it some thought. Let me think about it. Let me see if there's truth to this. So don't trap yourself in an echo chamber because that echo chamber tends to become what controls your mind, right? So even if it's on one, one side or the other of whatever your topic of choice is, it will take over in that side too, because you could be wrong. In fact, you are wrong about lots of things. Guaranteed 100%, you are wrong about lots of things. And so my recommendation and encouragement is find out what things you're wrong about, actually go look for them, and then try to figure out what's the right thing and then adopt that and don't be afraid of it. All right, I would encourage you to stop watching any mainstream media, period. Don't watch Fox News, don't watch CNN. Excuse me, I got a burp there. There we go. All right, should be good now. I wouldn't watch any of that crap because all of those places have extremely strong biases for you to think a specific way, okay? So if you're going to do it, I would do it in very small chunks and then go away from it, right? 
I've learned that if there's anything important, it will show up somewhere on one of my feeds close enough to the top that when I'm just posting and leaving and posting and leaving uh, on my stuff from for advertising the company, I'll see it and I'll go, oh, huh, that's interesting. And then I move on with my life, right? I don't watch any mainstream news media. And you know what? No hurricane snuck up on me. I heard about the hurricane before it actually hit me and I was able to take precautions and blah, blah, blah. And we were good, right? Like all this fear of, but if I don't watch it, that's they create the fear in your mind and then they use fear to get you to think a certain way, right? And they even make you afraid to not watch them because if you don't watch the news, you might miss something really important and then your whole life will be destroyed. They don't say it that way, but they create that feeling in us when we watch it all the time that I have to watch it. I have to, I have to know what's going on. Okay. We're going to talk about that a little bit more when we get into control your per perceptions. All right. So you can, so again, we're still talking about take control of your mind, read, listen to podcasts, listen to opposing views and listen to people who encourage freedom. Because here's the thing. When you listen to people who encourage freedom, you get a broad spectrum there too. You get total anarchists, which I am not. Uh, although a lot of the people I listen to are total anarchists. Like that's what they believe. They believe there should be zero governance at all. And I go, well, what you're doing is you're taking the very farthest end of the freedom perspective. And you're actually saying that's what we should do. I think we should move in that direction, especially from where we are right now. But you're never going to get there. There's going to be some point at which you stop. Right. And um, and then you get people who are like, you know, yeah, they Second Amendment, they shouldn't take our guns, but it's OK if we tax people for the roads and the schools and blah, blah, blah. And so in the freedom camp, quote unquote, you know, those are kind of your extremes on the freedom camp. Right. It's usually like they have a pet topic, but then they're generally socialist and a lot of other things. So it's it's still good to listen to a diverse group of people. Um, and then challenge your perspectives. So this takes a little bit of work, but ask yourself, number one, ask yourself, what do you believe? Because most people don't even know what they believe about hardly anything, right? So ask yourself, what do I believe about X? What do I believe about economics? What do I believe about religion? What do I believe about medical science? What, whatever the topic is, Ask yourself the question, what do I actually believe about that? And, and, <clears throat> and then try and form an idea, like a sentence or two. Uh, I generally think this. And then go, is that really true? Let me question that. Let me challenge it. Let me like push against it. Now, one of the reasons this is so hard to do is most of our beliefs are subconscious, which is why we don't know what we believe. And we've built aspects of our life and or given tremendous amounts of our time and energy to these beliefs. So when you try to question one of these beliefs, if you're wrong and you realize I was not correct there, you can often feel like you've lost. I wasted so much time on this thing, whatever it is. Right. And I would argue that's not the proper way to think about it. The proper way to think about it is everything I've done up until now has brought me to this point. And so now I'm able to actually consider the correct answer to this thing and move in that direction. Right. But it becomes like you will get a pit in your stomach. Your mind will go, no, it can't be true. And uh, and you have to try really hard so if anybody says anything to you and you react this way, nah, that's your reaction, then you have not properly thought through that. Because if somebody says something that challenges your beliefs and you've thought through it, your response is going to be this. Hmm, interesting. Zero hostility. If it's totally new, which normally what happens when you've thought through these things is, yeah, I've heard that a hundred times and they're early in the process. And so they're just going through their little thing and that's okay. And so I'm not going to smash them or bash them. Maybe I'll ask a question. Well, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? But in general, I have, that doesn't threaten me in any way. So I don't care, right? I don't care that you disagree with me. 
So either you'll react that way or you'll react this way. If it's truly new information to you, you'll go, hmm, interesting. I've not considered that particular aspect. You brought something new to my mind that I had not thought of before. I'll have to think about it. Because you shouldn't feel the need to immediately change your opinion based on some new piece of information. But you should also not immediately dismiss some new piece of information either. It's worth thinking about. And all of that is taking control of your mind, which if you stop and think about it for a few minutes, you should realize pretty quickly you do not have control of your mind, at least not 100% control. I try to be very diligent about this, and I find myself very often going, damn it, they got me, right? Why do I think that way? Because freaking everybody says I should think that way. Like a cuss word is a good one, right? Why do you feel like a cuss word is a cuss word? Here, I'll just go ahead and make this an explicit episode. If I say fuck, does that bother you? Why does that bother you? Why is that word offensive to you? Who said it was offensive? Who said that it means what other people say it means? When I was in school, they were like, oh, fuck means this. And then later on, you're like, what? No, it doesn't. Fuck is an acronym. It stands for for unlawful carnal knowledge. It was established when it was a crime to be adulterous or to um, what did they, what did they call it when you have sex before marriage? I can't um, can't think of the name of it. it. Like wants to pop into my head, but it's not quite going there. Fornication. There you go. And uh, and so if you would do these things, they would shame you by making you wear a sign that said you had unlawful carnal knowledge of another person, but. Because that's a long thing to write out on a sign. They would just write F-U-C-K. And that's where that came from. Just like this. If you're not on the uh, audio or the video, I'm flipping off the cameras right now. Why is that offensive to people? Where did that come from? Why is it something that bothers people? It originated in the French and English wars. The English invented the longbow. The longbow allowed them to shoot arrows farther than any of the smaller bows that had been used in warfare previous to that. And so the English were taunting the French and saying, you know, we're going to defeat you with our longbows. And the French said, we're still going to defeat you in this battle. And when we do, we are going to capture all of your archers and we are going to cut off their bird finger. Because at the time it was when they shot an arrow, they used a single finger and they released it. And it was called flicking the bird when they would release the string and the arrow would launch. And they did it with a single finger, their middle finger. And so the French said, we're going to capture all your archers when we win this battle. And we're going to cut off their bird fingers so they can no longer flick the bird at us. And they lost the battle. They did not win. Go English. And, uh, and so the English had the, all the soldiers that they captured tied up in a circle and their archers all rode around in this circle on horses, showing them their bird finger. Like, here it is. Guess you can't take it because you lost the battle. So how did that become an offensive thing? Like when you understand the history of the bird, it's like, oh, that's pretty cool. But why is that offensive to people? When you understand what F-U-C-K means, why is that offensive to people? Why is it offensive to say shit? It's just poop. So why is it okay that we can say, I'm going to go take a poop, but it's not okay for us to say, I'm going to go take a shit. Same thing with like, I'm going to go pee or I'm going to go piss, right? Piss generally isn't considered quite as bad, but who decided that these social norms were things? I totally reject that 100%. But this is all aspects of your mind being controlled. So that's just a very simple example of if you are offended by any of the things that I just mentioned, you really should probably ask yourself, why is that offensive? Who decided that that's offensive? And why does that person who decided it's offensive get to place any of their perceptions on me? Because why should their opinion matter at all? I don't care. Okay. Number two. So we don't go too long on this. We'll try and move through these a little bit quicker. Take control of your time. So last week's episode was essentially an hour of going over how to plan for a year so that you have year long goals, quarterly goals, much shorter term goals, uh, 
activities and tasks that will get those goals accomplished and how to set up your daily and weekly plan so that at the end of the year you have your goals accomplished okay so if it, for much more detail on that go listen to last week's episode episode 128 of the protection dog podcast but um i will just kind of go over this briefly so planning it's covered there scheduling is covered there my recommendation when you schedule is do not make a schedule that says i'm gonna do this first don't use a to-do list version of a schedule okay so a to-do list version of a schedule is this here are all the things i need to get done today go and then you start working on the to-do list and you make it like one third of the way through the list and then tomorrow you make a whole new to-do list and maybe some of the things from yesterday's to-do list get on it maybe they don't and then two or three weeks down the road you're like oh crap i didn't get that thing done that was on my to-do list two and a half weeks ago okay that's a bad way to schedule here's my recommended way to schedule to-do lists are good and i label to do this this way admin to-do lists dog training to-do lists um i call them projects but it's basically building things outside to-do lists right and i make these to-do lists and then i schedule my time in blocks and i say from 11 to 2 p.m., 11 a.m. to 2 p.m., I'm going to work on admin to-dos. And then I sit down and I, I work on those things. And when that time is up, I stop and I look at my schedule. My schedule says, now you're going to do this for the next hour. And I get up and I go do that thing, whatever that thing is. Okay. So my to-do lists are there, but they're within that block of time. And whatever doesn't get done rolls over so when i write my next admin to-do list i look at my new things and my old things i reprioritize because sometimes other new things have taken priority over the old things and then i write them down in priority order and i throw the old one away or at least i try to look i got lots of stuff around because i haven't gone through those in a while but i at least move them out of the way and then i start a new to-do list okay so schedule blocking is much more effective use of time and then learning how to stay focused during that time. I recommend a book called Mind Hacking by an author called Sir John Hargrave. Uh, I like the audio version because the second half of the audio book is him actually doing the concentration exercises. He literally talks you through it. And if you're supposed to focus on something for five minutes, he tells you what you're supposed to focus on. And then literally there's five minutes of silence so you don't have to look at a clock. And then in five minutes, he comes back on and says, okay, good job. Here's a few things to think about the rest of the day, go. And uh, so it's very good for teaching you to concentrate and stay focused on a specific thing. The book is called Mind Hacking. All right, so <clears throat> the, here's the biggest one for this particular episode though. Take control of your time, removing outside influences. Most people that say things like, I just don't have time. What they have done is they have filled their life with useless activities. That could be watching TV. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. But if you feel like I don't have time and you sit and watch too much TV, then you have plenty of time. You're just spending two or three hours every night watching TV. If you spend all afternoon, several days a week, running your kids around to their activities and you say, I don't have time, then you have to decide, are my kids' activities higher priority or is this thing I say I don't have time for higher priority, right? Um, we're going to get into a little bit more when we talk about taking control of your money on how to um, remove the outside influences of a job or minimize them. Okay. And not all of these are removing per se. A lot of it is minimizing these influences. So if your job is taking up eight hours, 10 hours a day, you can always think to yourself, is there a way to do this job that's satisfactory to my boss, my employer in less time? Maybe I work from home and maybe if I can work from home, I can get a full day's job done in four to six hours instead of eight hours. And then I will have more time. Maybe my children don't need five activities every week. Maybe they need one or two, and then I'll have more time. Maybe these social expectations, right? Like I don't go to people's birthday parties. I don't go to people's any parties. 
I don't go to social events. Now, I'm not saying that you should do that. I'm just saying if you're always doing that, you should maybe ask yourself, why am I going to all these things? Is it because I truly enjoy it and I want to spend time with those people? That's great. But one of the people that trains with us quite frequently is like, yeah, I got to go to this birthday party. Oh, well, who's that? I don't know. Some mom at my kid's school that I don't even know. And my kid's not even really friends with his kid, but we were invited. So we have to go. No, you don't. Right. That's a that is coming back to that perceived authority coercing you into doing something that not only you don't want to do, but that you probably shouldn't do. And this taking time away from you being productive in another area. All right. So you have a limited amount of days on earth. We'll talk about part of this concept a little more when we talk about money. But <clears throat> I refer to that as your life energy. From the moment you're born to the moment you die, we all have a limited amount of time. And your work and your effort and your just being alive is that's how much life energy you have. And it's very finite. What do you want to do with it? If you're doing things that are wasting your time or that are completely unproductive, then you're wasting your life energy. And when you start thinking about it that way, I gave eight hours of my life energy today to my employer. Was it worth it? I gave X number of hours today to sitting in front of a TV. I gave that many hours of my life energy into watching TV. Was it worth it? I'm not saying that the answer to either of those is yes or no. What I'm saying is ask yourself that question when you're deciding how to spend your time. Is it worth X number of days or hours or minutes of my life energy that I will never get back and will run out one day? All right. So number three, take control of your health. Okay. You do this three ways, in my opinion, at least three major ways. One is your diet. One is your physical activity or exercise. And then one is how do you deal with actually getting sick? Okay. So let's talk about diet first. I am a huge fan of ketovore carnivore. And I am not 100% carnivore. I'll just tell you that. But I'm going to give you the name of a guy who he's a doctor and he does encourage, he is a 100% carnivore, at least according to him. Uh, although his wife and child are not necessarily. Okay. Um, and he is open to what he calls ketovore or even keto in general. So ketovore is keto, but with a much larger push toward meat. And then keto in general um, is a, um, is very low carb, uh, high fat diet. Okay. Um, his name is Ken Berry, Dr. Ken Berry. He's got a YouTube channel. Highly recommend you go listen to some of his stuff. And on his page, his YouTube channel, you can actually, there's a search engine on, if you go to someone's channel where you can search videos on their channel. Okay. So if you have a question, well, what about this? What about that? All of the arguments and the resistance and the pushback against keto is go on there and type that in. And he probably has a video that addresses it. But I will just say this, if you've tried keto before and it quote unquote didn't work for you, you were almost definitely doing one of two things. You were going and buying all of the keto desserts so I could have, I could still pretend that my sugar addiction, which is exactly what it is, I'm satisfying my sugar addiction. I'm not actually getting rid of the addiction. I'm I, I, instead of drinking whiskey, I'm drinking beer. And then you didn't lose the weight you wanted and you quit or you just weren't disciplined enough to do it and you quit and then said it didn't work for me. OK. If you're whatever diet you decide to do, whether you want to do something like the paleo diet or whatever, or you just want to, you know, generally eat better, or whatever. The only way that really works is to take away all your other options. And so if you want to go keto. Throw away everything that has carbs. Don't buy any more. Buy lots of the stuff that is within the diet that you like. And the nice thing about keto is you can pretty much eat as much of that as you want. So I got rid of all the other stuff and I have some protein bars that aren't the best for it, but they're within my diet. I've got lots of meat, I've like lunch meat and stuff like that. I've got lots of cheeses. Um, Depending, for some people, nuts don't work, but for me, they work pretty good. So I, I have nuts around that I can snack on through the day. And I 
intentionally fill my fridge with things that I can snack on that are within my diet. And then, uh, and then you do a nice big dinner or whatever. And so whatever diet you decide you're going to go on taking control of your health is figure out what you need to do for that. And then just get rid of everything that you're not allowed to have right within that diet. I would also encourage you this way. If you're looking at diet, like something you're going to do until you, you know, lose a certain amount of weight or whatever, and then you're going to stop, it's probably not a diet that's going to work anyway. Not long-term. When you start looking into your diet, think about, I'm going to change my lifestyle for the rest of my life. And I'm going to eat this way for the rest of my life. When you look at it as temporary, it's much, much harder to do. When you look at it as I'm doing this forever, then it's much easier to do. And I will say we do a cheat day up to once a week. Now, sometimes I'll skip a week and I just won't even take a cheat day, especially if I know like Christmas is coming up and I'm probably going to do like three or four really crazy cheat days. And then I might go a month before that of zero cheat days. Now, I'm not saying always, but just keep those things in mind. Like when I knew we were going on some of these events we went on and probably on the trip and probably at the event and probably, you know, there's going to be numerous times in here that I'm probably going to cheat on numerous days. So for several months before we went on that trip, I just said, no cheat days. I don't want any. Like if you want to do a cheat day, do it, but I'm not going to. Right. But I do a cheat day um, on, a, on a normal schedule type of thing. Usually on Friday is my cheat day. And when we go out to eat after our bite work training and we go out to a restaurant, I order whatever I want. And my vice is ice cream in the evening. So I get ice cream and I have like eggnog, spiked eggnog in the fridge. If I'm at home, I might pour myself a glass of that right? Because that's high, high sugar. And I enjoy it. And then the next day I go right back on the schedule. If you haven't done keto or whatever your diet is long enough that you're not craving those things all the time anymore, you, you haven't earned a cheat day yet. So typically it's like 90 days. You have to go like three months hardcore and then you've kind of broken the habit at that point. And then you can do a cheat day. Now, if you do a cheat day and then you can't come off it or you can't get back on the diet, then you probably don't need to do cheat days, right? But it doesn't mean you have to do none of the things that are fun. It just means you have to be very, very careful. The next one is exercise. I really like and have personally gotten the most benefit from the CrossFit types of workouts. Um, but do something physical, whether that's walking, biking, rowing, swimming, um, you know, lifting, whatever it is, do something physical. If you have a very physical job, maybe that's enough. Uh, for me, it's not. And I have a fairly physical job. For me, just doing my job is not enough. Uh, I found out almost more important than my diet, I can fudge a little on my diet if I'm working out consistently. Um, but if I don't work out at all, I have to be hyper strict on my diet or I start gaining weight. That's just my body type. So diet, exercise, and then natural supplements and methods before pharmaceuticals. I am not a no pharmaceuticals guy. I use antibiotics. I use other things like that when I need to. But if there's something else that's either a supplement that I can do beforehand to try and prevent something from happening or a method that I can use to treat something, especially before it gets really bad, I go to those things first before I go to pharmaceuticals. So I don't just, oh, I'm feeling a little sniffle. Go get pharmaceuticals right now, right? I don't do that at all. I go, hey, i am got some sniffles. We should probably get some elderberry syrup out, maybe some raw honey, um, you know, vitamin C. Do things that boost the immune system first. See if it knocks it out for me. And for me, the majority of the time, if I do those things, boom, it gets knocked out. Or at least it's substantially less. And I can just maybe, you know, go three or four days maybe a week if it's really bad, and then I'm over it, right? This last uh, time me and my wife got sick a couple weeks ago, I just, I boosted up all my immune boosting stuff and just dealt with it for a couple of days and it was over. Whereas historically, I may have gone to the doctor and been like, give me some medicine so I feel better, right? So I would just encourage you when you're taking control of your health, look at fixing things or preventing things naturally first and then go to pharmaceuticals as needed. But don't just immediately jump into the pharmaceuticals. All right, number four, take control of your perceptions. So 
here's what happens. One of the reasons I encourage you not to watch mainstream media is this. Russia and Ukraine are doing a thing. And you should be really worried about it. Okay. I haven't watched hardly anything on Russia and Ukraine. It's been going on now, what, months, right? And nothing bad has happened in my life because of that. In fact, my life is better because I've just focused on the things that I'm doing. But watching things like mainstream news and even a lot of the alternative news stuff, right? They focus on all these things out there that have nothing to do with you. Like, I think war is terrible. But war happens all over the world. And war is happening in lots of other places than in Ukraine and in Russia right now or between Ukraine and Russia, there's all kinds of wars going on all over the place. And the news media only tells you about the one that they decide to tell you about. But here's the deal. I don't mean this in a callous or cold way. I don't care. You know why I don't care? Because I can't do anything about it. It's not, I don't not care because I don't think it's terrible. I think it's horrible. And if you ask me what I want, I want it to be over as quickly as possible so that the people can get back to their lives and stop suffering. But really. Do you care? Because if you really cared, you'd probably be on a plane heading over there and fighting alongside whichever side you think is the good side or sending money to them. So if you say you care, but you haven't sent any money and you're not over there fighting, then you're only lying to yourself. You don't really care. And this comes back to our perceptions. We've been led to believe that things that are not important that are happening halfway across the world that we have zero influence over are important. And the things that are happening right in front of you that you can change like your diet or your planning or your scheduling of your days and your weeks and your year, those are not important. It's an exact inversion of the truth. The things that are happening way out there Some of those things we should be aware of, and that's it. Okay, something's happening over there. Don't go over there unless I want to be involved in that thing. And everything else, focus local, close to you. So there's a way of describing these. I can't remember what book it was. This came out of some book. Um, So I apologize. If you guys know the book, you can send it to me and I'll try and put credits in. But they, they use a concept of sphere. So you have a sphere of control. So you're in the center of this diagram and there's a circle around you and the circle closest to you, everything inside that circle is called your sphere of control, right? So you get to decide what you eat today. You get to decide what clothes you put on. You get to decide when you wake up and when you go to bed and what you drink. And there's lots of things that you control in your life. Those are the things closest to you. And often those are the most important things. Those things and making good decisions within your sphere of control will have the most influence on your life. Okay. So affecting your health and your exercise and your scheduling so that you accomplish the things you want to accomplish. All of that is that extremely small, close sphere that's referred to as your sphere of control. And my argument is you need to, Alter your perception so that that becomes the most important thing. Taking care of yourself is the most important thing for you to do, even even so that you can take care of those that you love that are around you. Because if you try and take care of those that you love that are around you without taking care of yourself, it will be short-lived and you will ultimately fail. Okay? The next sphere, the next circle around that is your sphere of influence. Okay. So I can influence what my wife does and what my children do and what some of my clients do and some things like that. I can influence those things. And so they're outside my sphere of control. I can't force those people to do exactly what I want, nor should I, but they are within my sphere of influence. So after I make sure my sphere of control is is organized and set up the way it needs to be, then I focus on the sphere of influence. What should I be doing within this sphere, right? I should be encouraging good things, maybe discouraging bad things, maybe interacting and playing games sometimes with them and things like that. And, uh, and so that's where this, the time, energy, and focus that I have 
that I didn't spend on my sphere of control, the next place it gets spent is there. And then any other time outside that, and honestly, in my life, I don't have much time for things outside of those two spheres. But whatever time I do have, I I focus on the third sphere, which is a sphere of concern. And those are things that are close enough to you that they could affect your sphere of influence or your, you personally, but they don't directly affect you, right? They might. It's good to be aware of. Hey, there's a hurricane coming. Where's it going? Let's keep an eye on it. Oh, look, it went up and it hit North Carolina. Sucks for North Carolina, but it didn't affect me, right? But I needed to be aware of it. I needed to, it was a concern. And then I wrote, or nope, it turned and it's heading straight for us. Well, now my sphere of control and influence need to have a lot of things happen so that that storm can be taken care of, right? So something like that would be an example. Stop allowing things outside of these three circles to have any effect on your life at all. Now, here's what most of you will do. Well, yeah, but Ukraine, Russia, I'm just using that as an example because it could be whatever thing the news media is telling you to look at right now. Look, look over here. Usually if they're telling you to look over there, you should be looking somewhere else because they're trying to distract you from something that's going on. But whatever, Ukraine, Russia thing. Oh, nuclear war, nuclear war. It's in my sphere of concern. If you think, We're going to nuclear war with Russia. I think you're stupid. Now, that doesn't mean that we couldn't go to nuclear war with Russia. We could. It's possible. But we're not anywhere close to that right now. So it does not enter my sphere of concern. If we started sending troops over to actively fight the Russians in mass, then it would shift probably into my sphere of concern. I'd be like, mm, that's a pretty bold step. And, and that's a that's not just a, like poking the bear. That's like a shiving the bear, right? And so at that point, we go, mm, maybe this needs to shift into my sphere of concern. But to think, well, all the 10,000 things that would all have to happen for that thing to happen are going to happen when only one or two of them have happened. Therefore, it must be a my- No, stop. Stop focusing on things that have nothing to do with you because you can use that rationale. Well, but maybe, maybe possibly if all these things came into alignment and like Pluto became a planet again, then maybe that could, no, no. Most people waste most of their life energy being afraid of things that will almost certainly never happen, including you, including me. When we start to get into these fear things, but what if stop, it's almost certainly not going to happen. Focus on things that are within your sphere of control and your sphere of influence. All right. Number five, take control of your money. Okay. You do this by setting a budget, getting out of debt and saving. Okay. When we get to savings, I'm going to give a little bit of a Bitcoin spiel. So first, a budget. People will say, I don't make enough money. Here's the deal. If you're living above your means, meaning you spend more than you make, you are only going to doom yourself to failure. If you are, if you are not walking to work or riding a bike maybe, If you are not eating ramen noodles every single day for meals, if you are not wearing clothes that are all threadbare, then that is BS. I don't make enough money. You're just spending your money on things that you don't need. Now you will say, I need them. No, you do not. If you have more than one television, or even really if you have any television, If you spend any money on Netflix or cable TV, direct TV, yeah, I won't argue with internet because maybe you need that for your work, but any of these other things, if you're spending money on those things and you're saying, I don't have enough money, then all you're saying is it's worth me going into debt and destroying my life in the future to watch a show tonight. That's pretty foolish. So if you don't have enough money, you essentially have two choices. You can learn how to make more money 
or you can learn how to work less hours for the same amount of money so that you can take those extra hours and do something productive with them. Okay. So budget, how much do I make? What are my absolute required bills? And I highly recommend reading a book called the richest man in Babylon. And it goes into several things, but here's the primary gist of this. You should organize your life so that you pay off your debts. Getting out of debt was one of the key principles, right? So if you're in debt, there's lots of ways out there that people talk about getting out of debt, but here's, I, I love the richest man in Babylon process. If you are in debt, what you are going to do is you're going to budget 80% of your income. So I will not spend, actually, he says 70%. I will not spend more than 70% of my income. So whatever you make, you take 70% of that. And this is your take home, not your before taxes. You spend 70% of that and you organize your life around it. So if you've got a car payment, sell that car and buy a used one, right? If you have to, to get within this 70%. So you, you budget on 70%. 10% goes into a short-term savings just in case you need it. 10% goes toward debt. And then 10% is described this way. You keep that forever. You never let it go. And then they, they spend some time talking about how to make that last 10% work for you and make more money, right? That 10% is your slave and it makes more slaves, which become more slaves and your money is your slave and you keep using it to make more and more money, okay? Highly encourage you reading that book. So get out of debt, develop a budget, and then start putting something into savings. I was talking to my brother about Bitcoin the other day, and he said, oh, I just don't have money to invest in that. That's because people look at Bitcoin, and even now with it down right now, it's still somewhere between sixteen dollars and $18,000. Checked a couple of days ago, it was seventeen dollars something, but I, I don't keep an eye on it every day. He said, oh, I, I don't have enough to invest in that. Because people think, well, it's $17,000, so I've got to spend $17,000 on Bitcoin. No, you can invest $5 in Bitcoin. You can invest $10, 20, 50, 100, 200. I have a DCA set up where I spend $200 a month on Bitcoin. And so automatically every month it buys $200 of Bitcoin and then it stores it for me. Okay. So I'm going to spend just a minute talking about Bitcoin because this is really important and very poorly understood in general. Now, people that are into Bitcoin largely understand it, but most other people don't. So in Bitcoin, there's a saying called Bitcoin, not crypto. And there's a reason there's a saying for that, because 99% of crypto is centralized. Now, most of them or, or a lot of them claim to be decentralized. But here's how you know if a thing is centralized. If the government can send a letter to a building and demand that they do a thing, and the people in that building have the power to do the thing the government says they're supposed to do, it is not decentralized. That is centralized. And in crypto, unless you just wanna play the gambling game, which people do and they make money on, but that's not what I'm recommending. Unless you just wanna play the gambling game, in crypto, if it is centralized, stay away from it is my recommendation. Okay, so that's one. Don't get into centralized cryptos. Bitcoin is like most people who um, are Bitcoiners will say things like Bitcoin is not even crypto because they want to draw a complete distinction, right? Here are some of the distinctions between Bitcoin and crypto. Number one, they are not the same thing. Bitcoin is completely decentralized. That means no one's in charge. Zero people in charge. People will say things like, well, yeah, but the government will just say that X thing has to happen with Bitcoin. The government could say anything they want. They could pass any law they want, and it would have zero effect on Bitcoin in terms of the operation of the network doing what Bitcoin does. Because that's essentially what Bitcoin is, is a network. The network will do what the network does because the program and the code say that the network will do what the network does. And there will be zero influence based on the go any government in the world saying to do a thing. The only thing that might happen is what happened in China when they banned Bitcoin mining is the miners just packed up and left China and set up somewhere else because that's what the network will do. Okay. So there are millions of people 
operating the Bitcoin network, but no one person or, or even large group of them could make any impact to the network. Okay. It would take an overwhelming force that you will simply never achieve at this point. Early on, it was susceptible to those kind of attacks. But at this point, the network is so large and so powerful that if the United States of America decided to attack it head on, they probably would not be successful. And if they were successful, they would spend 100% of their budget on that one thing and accomplish almost nothing. So if they were going to attack it, they would be much better off buying a bunch of miners and mining it and making Bitcoin for themselves. Okay. And I'm not going to get into the technical side of those things, but it is not crypto in the sense that it is not centralized. No one can shut it down. Bitcoin will not be shut down unless the entire earth shuts down. And if the entire earth shuts down, you have way more problems to deal with than money. No matter how you saved your money, it's pretty much useless at that point. Okay. So it's not crypto. The other thing about Bitcoin that's unique is it the only exception to this may be Ethereum, but I, I don't know for certain. It may or may not be Ethereum, but Bitcoin goes up and then halfway through the halving cycle, which if you want to dig into more, you can figure out what that is. It drops about 80 percent. And then between that and the next halving, it shoots up way higher and then it drops down and then it shoots up higher and then it drops down. And it's this cycle. It's like this U-shaped cycle that it goes through. Bitcoin is the only crypto, the only blockchain technology that has continually risen over and over and over again. Over the last 10 years, it has averaged 100% increase per year. Now, that's not direct line, but average, that's what it's done. So it's always crashing down to a new high is a way to think about it, right? When it, I don't remember these exact numbers, but in general, like when it went from $5 to $1, they said, oh, it crashed. And it went, went then the next crash was it went from $100 down to $20. And then the next crash was $500 down to $100. And then the next crash was $3,000 down to $1,200. And then the next crash was $20,000 down to $3,000. And then the next crash was 70,000 down to 16,000. You see how those crashes work? I'll take those crashes all day long. That cycle sounds great to me. It's volatile, but it continues to go up. And it is <clears throat> the other thing that's key with Bitcoin. And there's a few others that limit it. But again, if somebody can change this policy, then it's not decentralized. Bitcoin will only ever have 21 million Bitcoin which means there is a hard cap on the number of Bitcoin that will ever be produced when the last Bitcoin is mined in 2140. Okay, so over 100 years from now, when the last Bitcoin is mined, it will max out at 21 million Bitcoin. That's all there will ever be. And so what that means is it will continue to increase in value. If you want me to talk more about Bitcoin and that sort of thing, send me messages. I could do a whole podcast on it. I don't want to belabor it here, but I just wanted to, if we're talking about taking control of your money, inflation is stealing money from your savings every year. If you have $100,000 and you take the government's official 8% inflation, then what that means is next year, 8% of that spending power is gone. And then the next year, 8% is gone again. And 8%, how many years do you go before you're down to essentially zero? See how that works? So, if you store in dollars in currency, it's constantly losing value. That's what inflation does. If you store in something like Bitcoin, it averages going up, 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 up because it's deflationary. Okay, I'm going to move on from that. Number six, this is closely related to taking control of your money, but it has a lot of other benefits to it too. Start a business. Now, I am not saying quit your job and start a business. That might be right for some people. It might not be right for some people. But start a business. This allows you to do numerous things. The tax code is like this thick. Okay. It's this huge, thick tome of pages. That's the tax code. And that much of it is what you have to pay. The rest is how to not pay it. And it was written this way by corporations. 
who lobby and say, this needs to be added into the tax code. And then they pay off politicians with um, whatever, you know, the money they give to politicians, campaign funds and stuff like that. And the politician puts it in the bill and then it gets passed. And what do you think those corporations are saying? Take more of our money. No, the corporations are saying there should be a tax break for this and there should be an exemption for that. And we should be able to deduct this from our taxes. And so it just keeps growing with all these exemptions. If you start a business and you just learn a little bit about how the tax code works, you can you can deduct so many more things from your taxes than you can do if you're a W-2 employee. If you just get a W-2 from your work and you have to file, you pretty much just fill in a, a couple of uh, spots on a form and boom, there's your amount. When you run a business, you can start to deduct all sorts of things. And it's totally legal. It's all in the tax code. And you can start paying less taxes. Now, I don't think we should pay any taxes. I think that taxes taxation is theft. However, I do believe we should pay for services, but those should all be voluntary. If you want to drive on this road, you pay to drive on this road. Not stealing half of what I pay in gasoline taxes every time I fill up my car. Okay. Um, but if you want to pay less in taxes, having a business and getting all the tax benefits of having a business is a huge first step. Also, if you do have a business and you build it up to making enough money that you could leave your job, you become insulated from all sorts of bad ideas. So whether you agree with masking or not masking, when all of the mandates came out on my facility where I train and where people come and train with me and blah, 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 I didn't do anything different. I just kept doing exactly what I was doing before because that didn't affect me. It didn't influence me. Right now, if I went outside that, there was some influence. But where I work on a daily basis, where I spend the vast majority of my time, didn't affect me one little bit. I just kept doing what I was doing. The other thing is you control your time. Now, if you're really bad at controlling your time, then in order to be successful at this, you have to learn to control your time. But if I decide today's work is fixing a chicken coop, keep in mind, I train and sell dogs for a living, then I control that time. If I decide today's job is advertising and getting a bunch of social media work done, I control that time. So I can spend the time in ways that will make the business more money, or I can spend time on ways that will make the business less money, but will benefit me in other ways, right? Or I could just decide I'm taking the day off and doing nothing today. Okay. Now there are always consequences to whatever decision you make, but you control your time. Some boss doesn't say, come show up and sit in this desk for eight hours, excuse me, and then go home and you'll get paid X amount of dollars for every hour that you were here. Right. And here's the other thing. And this comes back to remember, you can make more money or you can work less time for the same money. When you run your own business, you have the maximum control you're going to have over that part. You can decide I'm going to make more money and you can make good choices. And whether that's through marketing or hard work or whatever it is, you can make more money. You can affect your own income. So you can do the business and you can make more. You can do the business and you can make less. You can do the business and you can make the same amount, but you could organize and coordinate and systematize your business in such a way that you only have to work four hours a day to keep making the amount of money that you made. Okay. So I highly recommend starting a business. And on any of these topics, if you're like, I want a whole podcast on that topic, you guys let me know because I would love to hear your feedback on these things. Number seven, take control of your security. Learn to deal with stress. There is a company called, popping that over there, Tactical Response. The company is called Tactical Response. They are located in Camden, Tennessee. They come highly recommended. I've never been to one of their courses, but I have talked to numerous people who have, and I've heard them talk on numerous podcasts. <clears throat> they have a course called The Fight. And it is a dealing with stress course. It is how to make decisions under stress. It's a force on force course, right? But it's teaching you to, to recognize situations, make a decision and deal with a situation all under stress of force on force fighting. 
and it's like airsoft pistols and stuff like that. I highly recommend a course like that. Full Spectrum Warrior has another one, something called Decision Making Under Stress or something like that. Uh, I also recommend Full Spectrum Warriors courses. Okay. But that's the primary one. Learn to deal with stress because you can't take control of your security if you can't deal with stress. The second part of that is learn to defend yourself with your hands, with weapons of some kind, probably firearms, because those are the most effective weapons we have nowadays, and maybe a dog. Increase your security with your ability to physically do those things. Hands, weapons, primarily firearms, and if you're so inclined, have a protection trained dog. And then the third part is learn to think like a criminal. What do I mean by that? If I was a criminal, <clears throat> how would I attack me? If I was a criminal, how would I attack me in a parking lot? If I was a criminal, how would I attack me when I'm loading my vehicle? like my groceries and stuff like that. If I was a criminal, how would I attack my v my house? If I was a criminal, how would I attack me at work? See how that works? And then when you start thinking like a criminal, you go, hmm, this would be a really effective way to attack me. So how can I take a few measures to make myself more secure in that realm, right? What's the most likely way that somebody would attack me? How do I make myself more secure in that? So when you begin, when I walk into almost any building, just naturally, I start thinking, how do I, how would I attack this place? What are the exits? What are the entrances? Oh, look, glass all along the front. Put a bullet through any one of those windows, windows gone. I can just walk right through it, right? There's, I start thinking that way because I've trained myself to think, how would I attack me? Right? I used to do this on um, bases downrange, right? One of my jobs was setting up security on bases. So I would go, well, how would I attack this base? If I was a bad guy, how would I try and get through the, over the walls or through an entry control point or any of that kind of stuff? So start thinking like a criminal. How would you attack you if you were a criminal? And then that gives you things to start focusing on to take control of your security. Number eight, continue to educate yourself and take control of your children's education. I am a fan of getting your children out of government schools. They're not public schools. They're government schools. The government runs them. I'm a fan of getting your children out of those and homeschooling. But if you're not going to do that, that's fine. But you can still take control of your children's education in many other ways. You can ask them what they learn and actually like, no, you actually have to tell me what you learned today, right? And there are ways to have those conversations. You can also take control of your children's education by when they are with you, like on weekends, evenings, stuff like that, teaching them the things you want to make sure they know, right? Because you can pretty much assume that they're getting progressive ideas pumped into them at a government school. So maybe you go, well, I just want to give you the alternative view. Let's talk about the alternatives to those sorts of co concepts, right? The other part is always be learning. One of the guys I listen to says, you should learn a new thing every month, some new thing every month. That means that every year you've learned 12 new things. Over 10 years, you've learned 120 new things. Every month, learn something new. I don't know that I necessarily buy into that, but I am always looking into learning. I, I dive more deeply into the things I'm already interested in, right? So like you hear me talk about Jordan Peterson a lot because I'm interested in psychology of people and animals and how it all works together and then how that all works in the conflict realm right? Because protection is my business. And so how can I use those things to better train the dogs to fight, to better train my handlers, to deal with those situations and to better prepare myself to, um, to help train for that. So always be learning and be aware of what your children are learning. And then I, re we already talked about recommending getting them out of public schools and then give yourself and your children challenging questions to think about. Okay. And steel man your beliefs. So steel manning is giving the best argument you can possibly give to a counter belief, right? So I believe this, let's just say like creationism versus evolution, right? And you go, okay, so I'm an evolutionist. What's the strongest? I'm not saying that's what I am. I'm just saying like you take your position, right? Whatever your position is. What's the strongest argument I could make for a creationist? If I was going to believe that way, 
What's the strongest argument I can make in support of them? I used to literally sell this to people in debates when we, you know, in college, I used to love to get into debates with people about things. And I would go, yeah, I get your point there, but it would be a much stronger argument for you if you argued it from this perspective. This is a much better argument for you than the argument that you gave. That that one's weak. Here, here's all the weaknesses in it. I can shoot that holes all in it. But if you argue from this perspective over here, I still disagree with it, but it's a much stronger argument. And if you can't do that with the things that you believe, how would you lift up the person arguing against you and tell them, here's how you could do a better job in your argument? Then you haven't really thought through those beliefs very well. So Jordan Peterson calls it giving the devil his due, right? Whenever you have an idea, you should go, what's the counter idea? Let's give it its best argument that I can give it and see where we stand after that. Okay. So continue to educate yourself and take control of your children's education. Never trust the authorities. This is number nine. Never trust the authorities. Okay. So those mainstream media people and all that, if you just went through the last couple of years and you still quote, trust the authorities on a conscious level, well, you probably shouldn't be listening to me and I don't know why you are. But here's where we go wrong. Okay. I am not saying that mainstream media never tells the truth. What I am saying is that they either lie or manipulate the truth so often that you should always assume they're lying until you can prove they're telling you the truth. So here's a very common thing that they will do on headlines, whether this is on the TV or in the uh, on websites or in newspapers. They'll do this very often. They will, they create something called a finord. So a finord is misinformation in plain sight. So a, a story will break. Joe Biden is giving homeless people crack pipes, right? Remember that story? Joe Biden's giving homeless people crack pipes. That story broke. Okay. I didn't say it. It was a story that broke. So don't ban me on any of the platforms. And so this story comes out and then a counter story comes out. They said, because usually those stories are broken by like more of on the conservative side of things right now. Um, conservatives do it too, though, when the, the left picks on their people. So here's the Fenord. A counter headline comes out that says, Biden's not giving people crack pipes and meth pipes. See what they did there? They changed what people said, what the original story said so that they could say it wasn't happening. He's not giving them crack and meth pipes. Nobody ever said he was giving them meth pipes. They said he was putting in crack pipes in these little care kits, right? That's a finord. That's putting misinformation in plain sight so that most people read that and go, oh, well, I, th I thought the other headline said he was, but I, okay, and now I guess he's not, right? You see how that works? So a lot of people go, oh yeah, okay, that's been debunked then. It's been debunked. No, people actually got them. They opened them up. There was a crack pipe in there, but there wasn't a meth pipe as far as I could tell. I'm not an expert in any of those things. So I'm just telling you what other people told me, but that's a finord. So here's what happened to me though. I was in the military and I was in Afghanistan and they have CNN playing nonstop in the chow hall. So we'd go to the chow hall. I'd see these stories. And I started seeing stories of like, helicopter crashed in Afghanistan today and 12 soldiers died. And I was in a meeting every morning called the BUB, B-U-B, Battle Update Brief. This was a briefing where a bunch of us, I was in the among the people who had to give the commander information, a bunch of us showed up and we gave the commander of all combat troops in the country an update. And one of the guys in that meeting was the commander of the aviation unit, which those are the guys that fly the helicopters. So if they have a crash, guess what? That gets briefed in the bub. And I'm not the one getting the information. Like I'm not the one the information is intended for, but I hear it. Oh, helicopter crash. That sucks. People died. Every time there was a story about Afghanistan, it was either a direct lie or a misinformation. It was being tweaked in some way to try and get people to think a certain way. And once I started seeing that, I just assumed that everything they said was a lie. 
Right, so here's how I worked for Nords because I didn't know about for Nords for a long time. So I would see a story come out. Biden's putting crack pipes and gift bags for the homeless. And then a couple days later, I see another headline. Biden's not giving crack pipes and meth pipes to homeless people. And I would go, oh, giving them meth pipes too, huh? Yep, pretty much what I expected. And I just assumed the other thing was also true. So that be cautious of that as well, right? I was so distrusting that whatever they added in, I just assumed that was also true because I'm like, they lie about everything else. So why aren't they lying about that too? All right. So even with the mentality of they're always lying and I, I go so far into think even when they add stuff in these finords, I think that's part of it too. It's still very, very hard to always do this. Okay. So here's one of the things that will happen sometimes. You'll read something about a story that you know information about, right? Maybe you're a computer programmer and they'll say something about computer programming. Uh, and let's say you work in AI. And so they say this thing about artificial intelligence and you know enough that you're like, this is complete BS. Like, what the hell are they talking about? Right. But then you flip the page or you scroll on the Internet and there's another story. And you're not an expert in whatever that story is about. And you read it and you go, oh, inf interesting information. Now I have some information that I know. You know, they just lied to you on the story that you knew something about. So don't assume that they're telling you the truth on the story you don't know anything about. Because probably the person who is an expert on that topic is going, this is BS too. Always assume they're lying to you until they or you prove they're telling the truth. Very important because that affects your perceptions and taking control of your mind. Number 10, the last one, take control of your food. Okay, this is very important. Everybody's probably heard there's going to be um, supply chain shortages, food shortages, blah, blah, blah. No one in America or very, very, very few people, like statistically, no one in America is going to starve to death from these food shortages. But it probably will have some level of impact. It will probably raise prices. And there may be things that you want. Oh, hang on, got to check getting wet. Got to move that over there where it's safe and dry. Or there may be things that you really like and that brand is not available or something like that, right? Or you go to get something and it's out of stock today, but then it's back later this week. That's probably most of what's going to happen. But most of the stuff that you get in the grocery store is crap anyway. So I highly, highly, highly recommend you start producing some amount of your own food. It could just be having a window garden, like a little window box with some herbs in it. But what happens when you start producing even the smallest amount of your own food is you start realizing where food comes from what it takes to grow it and you begin to have a much higher degree of respect for that whole system and what could happen if things go bad right and so if you can't produce some of your food if you absolutely can't do it then at the very least make contact with local farmers and or ranchers you know so go to the uh what do they call them? the farmers markets right Start talking to the people who are actually growing this stuff and start building relationships with them. Because if times get rough and you want certain things, if you have a relationship with someone, you're going to get that thing before somebody who doesn't have a relationship with that person, most likely. So a couple of things you can do to start taking control of your own food. We talked about the really small scale, like a little window box and you put a little soil in it and plant a plant in it. You could have a garden, right? This could be a small garden. When I was a kid, I had like a 10 by 10 garden. I had like a row of tomatoes, a row of cucumbers, a row of bell peppers. Uh, I think I had some cantaloupe in there, maybe a row of watermelon, something like that. And I thought it was the coolest thing because like I, got, I couldn't get tomatoes to ripen on the vine without getting bugs in them, but I would, I would pick them when they were green, ate lots of fried green tomatoes during that time. But I thought that was just great, right? It could just be a small garden. Um, or something really big, right? But start small, 
if you're gonna if you don't garden and you decide i'm gonna try and garden it start very small 10 by 10 is great right start with some animals now animals are typically a little harder than a garden but if you live out in the country you get a couple chickens or a couple rabbits or a goat or something like that um, so if you're so inclined uh, animals are great you could do something like a hydroponic system so let's say you live in an apartment you can't have a garden you can't raise animals i mean i guess if you wanted to have rabbits you could but it'd probably be really messy but you could set up a little hydroponic system in your apartment uh cost you maybe 100 to 200 dollars to set up and especially if you're growing greens like lettuce greens and stuff like that you could grow probably more than you can eat when we germinate well we have more than we can <clears throat> can eat and our hydro system grows very 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 fast and very efficiently and then start building that community and network for getting food so if you live in a neighborhood and and uh, somebody down the road gardens see if you can become friends with that person see if you can start buying some of their stuff from their garden or trading for it or doing something like that learn from them how do you do that what what plants do you grow what things grow well here what things don't grow well here build networks and community and relationships with people who are doing some of this themselves so that not only can you learn but also if you want to keep rabbits and they have a really big garden well how about i give you a couple rabbits for a basket full of your garden stuff right and i'm not saying this because oh you're going to be starving and this is how you have to live just like i don't think there's going to be nuclear war um i don't think that that's going to happen to our food supply system but having that ability the food that you're getting from them and the food that you're producing yourself is so much healthier than anything you buy in the store that it's not even worth comparing the two together. When you can pluck a lettuce green and you, know, you pluck things off your hydro system, you make a salad and you eat it, it tastes totally different in a good way than buying a bag of mixed lettuces at the store and bringing them home and making a salad. Also, if you like salads, you price per pound how much you pay for lettuce greens. Hydro, a hydro system and growing lettuce greens will make you money. It will make you money if you like salads. So that's my little stuff there. All right. The only other thing I'll say on these 10 things is do not try to do all these things at once. You'll become overwhelmed and you'll quit. Pick one or two that resonate with you. Okay. Because especially if you try and do something like take your kid out of government school and start teaching them at home, that all by itself is a major undertaking. I've gone through it. I understand it. It is not an easy thing to do and it takes a lot of commitment. Okay. So don't try and do all 10 things at once. Don't go buy $10,000 of Bitcoin and, you know, start listening to three hours a day of audio and podcasts and change your diet and start exercising when you don't do it currently. And all of a sudden there's a whole new planning and scheduling and blah, blah. Don't try and do that. You'll just get overwhelmed and quit. Pick one or two things. If I had to recommend I would say the number one thing I would recommend is start planning and scheduling. Plan your year and schedule your days and weeks. The number two would be take control of your health, diet and exercise. Do those two things. Start small, build big, start with small steps because every step you take gives you all of that accumulated knowledge you've had for the next step and the next step gets bigger and then it gets bigger again and then it gets bigger again. If I had to recommend, those would be the two that I would recommend. And then get off of mainstream media. Just stop listening or watching at all, right? Even doing like a, a electronics fast. Don't do any social media or any mainstream media for like a month. Um, and then just see how you feel. Come back, listen to the episode again, or look at the show notes, because I, I have all 10 of these things in the show notes. And then go, okay, do I need to keep doing one of these things or all of these things? Or do I need to shift to a new thing? And start working on that. And don't just do something because you heard me say it. Like if you're like, yeah, that thing doesn't, won't really help me. I'm not going to start a business. Then just don't start a business, right? Don't feel like all 10 of these things have to be true in your mind or none of them are. Take each one at its own value and decide what you want to do or not do for it. All right. So let's go over you guys' comments real quick. Pippin Eyes, good to see you again. 
Hope you enjoyed it. I love when uh, you guys pop on, especially our, our regulars that pop on and we get to chat with you guys here. Um, okay, my wife said Publix has dropped a quarter of the items and they're using multi displays to hide it. Yes, every place is doing this. So what they do is they either don't stock it so deep so that they can spread it out wider on the shelves or um, the stuff that they have in the back, they just bring up, right? So previously they may have had full shelf stock and a bunch of stuff in the back and they're getting like a couple trucks a week coming in. So they just keep pushing it, but it, it's full in the back and it's full on the shelves and it's just rolling out the doors, right? Now what they do is they start spreading it out and like you'll walk into the chip aisle, for instance, and you'll just see the same bag of chips all the way down the top row of aisles for like 30 feet, right? When before it was like there were like three wide and 10 deep, and then there were a bunch in the back, right? But there were all these different selections and options. Now it's like Lay's potato chips, the yellow bag, all the way down the, you know, halfway down the aisle. And, uh, and so that sort of thing is happening in all of the major retailers and it's it's going to fluctuate right it's they're going to be out of something and then they'll get it in and then they'll be out of something and they'll get it in when we shut down the economy during the lockdowns we started a a reaction that is going to like slinky like if, i don't know if any of you have been in the military when you do a really big group run in the military you all start off in formation you are like dress right dress i am like you know um, about a foot and a half off of this guy and this guy, and I'm about a foot and a half behind that guy. And the person behind me is a foot and a half. We're a square. We're in perfect formation. We're taking steps, you know, left, right, left, right, right. You're marching in order and they go double time and you get ready to start jogging and you, but you're still in step. It's left, 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 right, left, right. And you're going and you're doing your thing. And that lasts, right? So you got a battalion, right? So it's four companies and each company has four platoons. The platoon's like 30 guys, right? And so you've got like 16 of these things and you're running down this road. And in the beginning, everybody's marching and everything's good. And then all of a sudden, if you're in the middle point, you know, maybe a half mile in, you have to kind of speed up a little bit to catch up because all of a sudden the guys in front of you speed up. And you run, 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 and you catch up and then you slow down. It's like, whoa, whoa, and like we're all like right on top of each other. And then we kind of get back. And then that goes for a little bit and then the opposite speed up again and then slow down. And the farther in the back you are, the more you end up sprinting and then walking and sprinting full speed and then walking again. And if you're in the front, it seems like you're just jogging along, but it gets this slinky effect thing going, right? That's what happened to the supply chains when we had the COVID lockdowns worldwide. It paused things that couldn't just be started right back up again. It's not like you just flick the switch off and then, oh, we need it again. You flick the switch back on. A lot of these things take a week or more to get moving again once they're shut down. You can't just turn them off and turn them on. And, um, and so because of that, all of that shot goes all through the system. And you see it, especially with things that are very complicated, like cars, right? With cars, they need components from like 15 different countries and 50 different factories spread out between those countries. And then they have to move to other countries to get partially assembled. And then they have to move to the final country where it's all put together. And they'll have, they'll be missing one or two parts out of that whole system and everything freezes because we can't move on until we have this computer chip and put it in the car. And until that computer chip's here, we just have to stop. And that sort of thing is going all through. So you will get bundles of things and then there will be a slack of that particular thing. And then it'll come back and you'll get a bunch of it and then it'll go away. So I would just tell people, just expect that over the next, it'll probably take five to 10 years to fully get over that process and to get things rolling smoothly. All right. So I'm scanning through your comments over here on Instagram. Uh, does moving typically cause stress to the handler that the dog reacts to? That could be part. So in the very beginning, we talked about um, dogs reacting to moves and stress and anxiety and things like that. If the person is really stressed, the dog will react to that almost always. So if that's the problem, if the person is really stressed out, um, then just understand once you settle back in, then the dog should also come back down. 
So, but certainly that could be another aggravating factor. And uh, my wife posted that up for me because she's like, you need to talk about this. That's, she doesn't say it in that voice. I just like to say that voice whenever I mimic her. And uh, But she's like, hey, don't forget to tell them about this. And so she'll put that in. So I appreciate Weather. that, lady. Weather regards. Uh, is that another question? No, nope, I'm just telling you. Yeah. Okay, so in Florida, tomorrow and the next day is going to get really cold for Florida. When I was in Alaska, we'd be like, that's like spring. But it's going to get really cold for us here. And so remember, if your dogs spend time outside, um, make sure that they're well taken care of. All right. So like, uh, I'll be taking all my dogs that spend time that can't come inside. They'll all be coming home with me. And that's why the house full of dogs and, uh, and all of the dogs that are, uh, in the kennel area. Um, I'll be closing up the back and uh, turning the heat on in the kennel to keep them warm. So just don't forget, um, whenever you have an extreme temperature fluctuation, your dogs can't necessarily acclimate that fast. So make sure they're well taken care of uh, in the weather that's coming up. So most of this time of year is going to be um, cold snaps, right? And especially like today was t-shirt. It was overcast and it rained a little this morning, but then it was just like t-shirt weather the rest of the day. It was real comfortable and, and nice and not super sunny. And then tomorrow it's going to be in the 20s. So you get a, a, a rapid drop like that. You want to definitely make sure you take care of your animals in those situations. And uh, let's see. So it looks like we had quite a bit of you guys, but not so much um, uh, messages back and forth. So it looks like we are wrapped up. Uh, I appreciate you guys being here. If you have any thoughts, questions, comments, you want to tell me how much I suck or that you appreciate certain things or that you would like to continue hearing um, any of the topics we talked about today or any other topic that's come to mind, uh, feel free to send those to me. You can do that by emailing me at joel, J-O-E-L, at fortressk9.com. You can also text me. Remember, do not call me, but you can text me at 813-836-9244. Um, you can also sign up for our emails on my websites at fortressk9.com and k9academy.us. Don't forget to follow us on all the social media platforms. We're on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, Float, MeWe, Twitter. I think that covers most of them. And uh, any of those places that you tend to be at, please share our stuff. Give us five-star ratings, comment, share it with your friends and family, tell people about it, all that good stuff. All of that helps us. If you like what we're doing here and you'd like to support us, that is one of the best ways to support us. Also, do not forget our two franchises, Canine Philosophy and Mountain Vista Canine. They are both on Instagram and TikTok, and it's at Canine Philosophy and at Mountain Vista Canine. Both of those, remember, anytime you see K and 9 in any of our stuff, it's the letter K, the number 9. So uh, make sure you check those guys out. They're both worth following and got lots of great information. Um, and don't forget, uh, tell your friends about us, share our websites. And if you'd like to exchange value for value, uh, you can listen on the fountain app and you can send us boosts, which will send us Satoshis, which is little bits of Bitcoin. And, uh, and we would really appreciate that. So next week's topic is going to be how to kill yourself a little bit every day to become your best self. And we will have more at the end of that will be, and what the hell does any of this have to do with dog training? Uh, I don't like getting too far away from that. Also wanted to make sure I reminded you guys, we do have a Dutch Malinois breeding uh, open. We are starting to get reservations on that now. So if you're interested, reach out soon. And we have two puppy slots left on our German Shepherd litter. So if you're interested in getting a German Shepherd, uh, now is your opportunity. I won't be doing another one until the very end of next year. All right, guys, I appreciate your time. I hope you enjoyed it. And until next time, remember to train hard and stay safe. Fortress Canine Podcast.